Hi guys. Happy Friday. Let me know. I think there's two of me in the stream. Let me know if you're hearing an echo. There we go. That sounds better. Anyway, so if you haven't seen the news, you probably have seen it already or you can tell from the thumbnail of this video. Judge McAfee has ruled that Fonnie Willis can stay, but Nathan Wade has to go. And there's a bunch of other moving parts going on. You've got, you know, the state Senate committee hearing. You've got a bunch of things happening. There's news reports that Fonnie Willis wants to revoke Trump's bond. Um, just so many moving parts. So as we go through this, whether you're on replay or you're going to watch this in the live chat, we're going to be reading the full decision from Judge McAfee. And I'm sure there's going to be tons of food for thought along the way. Um, but some things to think about. What, what do you think if you were jo Joycelyn Wade and you were in the middle of this divorce and Nathan Wade had told you or on his divorce paperwork said he was making like $2,000. He had $2,000 to his name. Then you find out he gets this big contract. Then now he loses this contract moving forward. You know, there's 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 such a mess here that's stemming from the different things that are, that are going on in this case. Um, but again, we're here to talk about Judge McAfee's ruling on the disqualification. The full document is here. Let's start going through it. And I wasn't sure. I didn't think I'd be available, but this came out really early, so we can do it. So this is from Judge McAfee this morning, order on defendant's motion to dismiss and disqualify the Fulton County District Attorney. On January 8th, defendant Roman filed a motion to dismiss the indictment and disqualify the Fulton County DA's District Attorney's office. Again, that was supposed to be, the motion was disqualified, the whole thing. And this decision, as far as we know, seems to be like, it's just Nathan getting the boot. Eight co-defendants later joined and supplemented the motion, raising grounds for disqualification. And they're citing all the stuff from Trump, Giuliani, Meadows, Schaefer, Chile, Floyd, and Latham, and Clark. Among other allegations of disqualifying conduct, the defendants contend that the district attorney obtained a personal stake in the prosecution of this case by financially benefiting from her romantic relationship with Nathan Wade. They're going to refer to him as SADA. We'll call that SADA. SADA? SADA? whom she personally hired to lead the state's prosecution team. More specifically, Defendant Roman alleges that the district attorney and Wade traveled together on multiple vacations, with Wade covering many of the associated expenses. Defendant Roman later supplemented, and remember, anytime they say Defendant Roman, that is Ashley Merchant's client. So these motions, when it says Defendant Roman did something, it's Ashley Merchant, John Merchant, filing these motions, advocating for their client. Defendant Roman later supplemented his motion with receipts from these travels. The state responded with an affidavit arguing that the district attorney had not received any financial benefit through her relationship with Wade and that their personal travel expenses were roughly divided equally. As alleged, the claims presented a possible financial conflict of interest for the district attorney. More importantly, the defense motions and the state's response created a conflict in the evidence that could only be resolved through an evidentiary hearing and one that could not simply be ignored without endangering a criminally accused constitutional right. Because that's that's really why this is an issue, right? Is because the, the co-defendants have certain rights. They have a right to a fair trial. And if there's some type of personal interest or conflict of interest in with the state, right? Because the state's mission is to pursue justice not to pursue a win, not to pursue a personal vendetta. This is why Judge McAfee is saying this was why we had to have an evidentiary hearing in the first place. So after two and a half, after receiving two and a half days of testimony, during which the defendants were provided an opportunity to subpoena and introduce whatever relevant and material evidence they could muster, the court finds that the defendant failed to meet their burden of proving that the DA, so this is why Fanny's not disqualified, acquired an actual conflict of interest in this case through her personal relationship and recurring travels with her lead prosecutor. So, standard we're going on here. Judge McAfee, that looks like he's going on the actual conflict, not just appearance of. The other alleged grounds uh, for disqualification, including forensic misconduct, are also denied. However, the established record now highlights a significant appearance of impropriety that inf infects the current structure of the prosecution team an appearance that must be removed through the state selection of one of two options. The defendant's motions are therefore granted in part. So here, this is where Judge, Judge, McAfee, Judge McAfee is saying, look, I don't think Fani, what Fani was doing, I don't think the defendants met their burden of proving that there was an actual conflict in terms of Fani Willis. 
But there are some other, other grounds that we have to look at. I'm going to grant some of what you're requesting in part. We already know that some of that is going to be Nathan Wade has to go. So actual conflict of interest. And remember, this was something that when, when you watch the hearings, when you watch the closing arguments, this point, actual conflict of interest versus appearance of, of interest, was one of the main arguments going back and forth. It was a key thing that Judge McAfee had to decide. Our highest courts consistently remind us that prosecutors are held to the unique and exacting professional standard in light of their public responsibility and their power. Every newly minted prosecutor should be instilled with the notion that she seeks justice, and we're using she here, which is, you know, usually it's just by default, the he language. She seeks justice over convictions, and that she may strike hard blows but never foul ones. Most importantly, prosecutors are expected to assume a role beyond a mere advocate for one side and must make decisions in the public's interest, not their own personal or political interest. Recognizing these are not empty slogans nor toothless admonitions without practical e effect, Georgia courts have not hesitated to step in and use their inherent authority to disqualify a state prosecutor when required, especially when a prosecutor labors under an actual conflict of interest. So actual, actual, actual. And then they cite a bunch of case law. Disqualification of a prosecutor due to a conflict of interest is thus not a creature of statute so much as it is a judicial remedy recognized by our appellate courts since their formation. Generally on grounds of public policy as the administration of the law should be free from all temptation and suspicion so, as far, so far as human agency is capable of accomplishing that object. So tons of con... like. Like this guy, <laughs> Judge McAfee came with all the cases. I mean, this is like, what, eight cases already? Well, that's the code. One, two, three, four. I think we had some above this too up here. He's gone through so many cases. He's like, I am looking for all the letters of the law. Any, any, all the alphabet. I'm finding a case that starts with each one and making sure I am covering my grounds and writing this decision. The Georgia Supreme Court has most recently denoted conflicts of interest and forensic misconduct as the two generally recognized grounds for disqualification. A conflict of interest includes acquiring, quote, a personal interest or stake in the defendant's conviction. So tons and tons of case law, which we all expected. This is so because the prosecutor's duty to the public creates an additional public interest that must remain unconflicted in every cr criminal case. So it doesn't matter if it's Trump or Joe and Jane Smith. A determination of whether a prosecutor is laboring under a conflict of interest is a fact-driven one, so you can only rely on what's on the record, facts that are in evidence. So here, in this case, Wade's manner of payment is not actionable on its own. Whenever a private attorney, because remember, he's not an employee of, or I guess he's neither, he's neither a special prosecutor or an employee of the DA's office, but he, was, he wasn't employed by the Fulton County DA. He was appointed as a special prosecutor and was still able to retain his, his role as a private attorney, which he wouldn't have been able to do if he was simply hired by the DA's office. So here, you know, whenever a private attorney like Wade is paid by the billable hour, a motive exists to extend or prolong the assignment. This, however, is a tension that the legal professional has long accepted. It is also this, so maybe that's a question for the bar not for me as a judge. It is also the type of speculative status violation that our courts have regularly denied as insufficient grounds for disqualification, absent solid proof of other conduct. Thus, you know, the special attorney oath of office, Nathan Wade's oath of office, in combination with the supervision theoretically provided by a neutral and detached DA, should generally be sufficient to dispel the appearance of that improper incentive. Nor would a romantic relationship between prosecutors standing alone typically implicate disqualification, assuming neither prosecutor had the ability to pay the other, as long as the relationship persisted. But in combination, as is alleged here by the defendants, a prima facie argument arises of financial enrichment and improper motivations, which inevitably and unsurprisingly invites a motion such as this. So he's like, look, it's because there's this combination of elements, right? It's not just the relationship, and it's not just an issue of billable hours, because sometimes that's a gray area in the legal profession generally. But we've got both, so that's why we're here. As to the financial allegations, so that's what we're focusing on in this next paragraph. The court makes the following factual findings. On November 1st, 2021, 
the district attorney hired Nathan Wade to serve as special attorney and lead the investigation that produced the indictment in this case. The district attorney considered it let at least one op- other option before hiring Wade, extending an offer to former Governor Roy Barnes, who declined. The contract allowed a $250 hourly rate, a relatively low amount by Metro Atlanta standards for an attorney with Wade's years of service, and contained a ceiling on the maximum number of hours permitted. Under the terms of the first contract, Wade was not to perform more than 60 hours of work per month without written permission. No evidence introduced indicates that Wade ever received permission to exceed those monthly hourly caps, thus make more than the allowable limit. His contract was renewed on November 15th, 2022, and again on June 12th, 2023. Between October 2022 and May 2023, the DA and Wade traveled together on four occasions that resulted in documentable expenses. The first included an extended trip in October 2022 to Miami and Aruba. So they're going to go through all these trips. So we've got the $5,000 here. They go to Miami, and once they're in Miami, they board for another cruise. There's plane tickets that we're aware of that were over a thousand dollars. Cruise, they're they're these were supposed to be conservative numbers of what was was provably booked by both passengers. So this bill here says the thirty six hundred. Um, then they have the Belize trip in March, and then we've got this one here for Napa Valley, which is another twenty eight hundred dollars. And then they say, in addition, the two describe taking a number of day-long road trips to Tennessee, Alabama, South Carolina, North Carolina, and other parts of Georgia. They also admitted to dining out on multiple occasions and taking turns covering the bill. With seemingly full access to Wade's primary credit card statements, the defendant did not produce evidence of any further documentable expenses or gifts, nor were any revealed through the testimony. In total, defendants pointed to an aggregate, aggregate documented benefit of, at most, approximately 1200 to 15000 12000 to 15000 in the DA's favor. So here he's considering and all these trips at most the benefit to Fani could have been that's according to facts in the record not speculation or guessing but based on these numbers that are I think they were introduced through capital 1 statements um at most Fani would have benefited approximately 12000 to 15000. The district attorney and Wade testified that these expenditures were not meant as gifts and not designed to benefit the DA. Both testified that the DA regularly reimbursed Wade in cash, and if not reimbursed, the district attorney covered a comparable related expense. For example, the district attorney testified that she reimbursed Wade in cash for the Aruba trip, which she estimated was about $2,000 and that she gave him money for both cruises. She further claimed that she reimbursed Wade for the entirety of the Belize trip and that she paid for the Napa Valley excursions. And I'm always losing my voice, but hold on. (laughs) And I do want to say hi to you guys that are rolling into the chat. There's a lot here. And I see Pam. Pam, you kind of, you're saying here that Wade and Fani should be ashamed. I mean, Wade's still got to deal with that divorce case after all this. (laughs) I mean, Fani has like, there's, there's other things that are in motion that are looking to disqualify her or sanction her through another means. Wade's got that big divorce where they're going to be looking at his finances that he initially approached the divorce saying he had like $2,000 in his account. Then he gets this huge contract, way more than $2,000. It's like, I don't know, $700,000 something. He still got that to deal with. And then now he's losing the contract, but he's still in hot water over there. And they said, Joyce Lynn's attorney, she's, she said that, you know, Joyce Lynn... She was a stay-at-home. She was a homemaker. She has medical bills that she's not able to pay because he's not helping support her. That's not good. <laughs> Matthew had said, I think it's kind of a win for Fanny. For Fanny, Wade will just have to go. Unfortunately, the Trump team won in delaying the case for like 90 days. The judge made a good call. I mean, this is like kind of literally splitting the baby. It's like, you know, Wade can go. <laughs> Fanny can stay. And, you know, I think there's that argument to be made there that You know, we have Nathan Wade, who was paid $500 an hour to investigate what was going on in Cobb County prisons. And when they finally asked him, all right, what did your report? What did you find? What's your work product? He's like, well, I don't have documents or paperwork or anything like that. And the interviewer was like, well, what do you have? I think this is on 11 Alive Network. And he's like, well, I have what's in my head. And it's like, (laughs) what? So it's one of those things where, you know, maybe if Nathan... Wade stayed on this case, 
that would be beneficial to the defense. If he isn't good at organizing his work product, if he doesn't have documentation, if maybe he's not qualified for the job, which I don't think that Judge McAfee is going to get into this, but we're on the outside, we're the public, we're not the judge making a ruling, we can have a discussion and consider these things, right? If Wade potentially was not qualified for this type of case, him getting kicked off, even though that seems like a win in this decision because the defense filed for it, having someone that isn't qualified to prosecute you, prosecuting you, could, could be a very strategic advantage for the defense. And now maybe we don't know who wants to replace him. We know that Roy, Roy uh, didn't want to take this position. Someone else is going to have to step in. And, you know, maybe they could be better. Maybe they could be worse. We don't know. But I think there's grounds for us to say, hey, it's possible Nathan Wade wasn't cut out for this type of case. And him, if he was allowed to continue prosecuting it, that could have been a win for Trump and his co-defendants, and it might be an L if they appoint someone that's actually, like, knowingly, undisputably qualified. I don't know what you guys think about that, though. And then Patrick says, the judge thinks he's choosing between war and dishonor and choosing dishonor, but as Churchill predicted, he'll get war. It isn't over, but his legal career may be. What I think, I do think he might be relying on these other pieces that are in motion. I mean... There's there's the bar. There's the the state senate committee. Uh, Jim Jim Jordan was trying to move forward with something that he's doing. I didn't get to look at all the details or see if that has teeth. Um, but I mean, just because this decision came down today doesn't mean this is the end of the drama that came out of it. Like I don't think any. I think no matter what you want out of this case, no matter what side of the political spectrum you might stand on, I think everybody can find a common ground and say, hey. The drama that we've gotten so far from this, this is not going to be the last we hear of it. And then John says she can probably hire him for other cases, um, or he could just go back to private work. You know, you never know. And then now Fani is going to hire somebody even more experienced, and they're going to eviscerate the Trump defense team. And that's kind of like the risk of doing that, right? If you think he's, if you think someone's not qualified to be a prosecutor, but then you boot him off the case, and the case doesn't get dismissed because of the the disqualification here it's only for nathan wade it's not for funny well you made a motion that was to for disqualification and dismissal you only get the disqualification and now you could be putting yourself in a situation where you're up against someone who's tougher uh more prepared more organized honestly more likable you know i don't Sometimes people, juries make decisions because they don't like the way the prosecutor seems or they don't like the demeanor of the defense attorney. And that affects the way that they perceive the facts of the case, right? So if Nathan Wade was kind of unlikable, if when you see him, personally, he smiled a lot on the stand when he was answering questions. It came, came off a little bit disingenuous to me. A jury that could be very favorable for the defense in trial if the jury kind of gets that same vibe from a prosecutor, you know? So I, I'm agreeing that there's there's reasons to believe, hey, losing the DA, the special prosecutor that might not have been the best for this job, isn't really the best win for the defense, even though they made the motion. But, and then yeah, a win is a win. It's still something because then this is still making news headlines either way. This as a political move, no matter... So think about Republicans that don't like Trump. They might not care what happens with the RICO case, but Republicans could be very happy to see a judge say, ha ha, you did something wrong, district attorney that is from the Democrat Party. You know what I mean? There's just, there's so much from just one little decision. And then what about Bradley? I think he's going to have bar issues, but I also think who would know him and then still want to hire him? And then, so Crystal, seems like if they lose and they have good grounds for an appeal. <laughs> so here's my take on that. When you have this many co-defendants, there's going to be a kitchen sink of appellate issues, no matter what. Honestly, no matter how perfect a judge calls things, when you just have this many moving parts, there's always going to be, there's going to be so many appeal arguments made. And I'm sure that they're going to appeal this decision, like, right away. And we'll, we'll get to see some of that before the trial even kicks off. So, uh, but yeah, when you have so many co-defendants, there's always going to be a lot of 
of uh, of motions and appeal arguments if post conviction just you know how it goes i think i left off here where we just finished talking about the meals that were paid for and then here we're going to get to judge mcafee saying hey such a reimbursement practice may be unusual and the lack of any documentary corroboration understandably is concerning right i think we can kind of all agree right you know when you work for public office uh, if you guys have ever had a job where you've worked as a freelancer or you work something that with something that involves invoicing or bookkeeping, it's kind of weird that you wouldn't just innately keep a receipt one time, right? So the, so the judge here is conceding, yeah, that's understandably concerning. Yet, the testimony withstood direct contradiction, was corroborated by other evidence. For example, her payment of airfare for the two on the 2022 Miami trip and was not so incredible as to be inherently unbelievable. However, as the defense attorney herself acknowledged, no ledger exists, other than a best guesstimate. There is none, he put it in quotes. <laughs> I mean, I use guesstimate in my, my language. There is no way to be certain that expenses were split completely evenly, and the district attorney may well have received a net benefit of several hundred dollars. Despite this, after considering all the surrounding circumstances, the court finds that the evidence did not establish the... Di so he's basically saying, you know, common sense or gut instinct could let me say, the math doesn't math here. That doesn't seem believable on its face. But the court finds that the evidence, so the facts that were in evidence, what is on the record, did not establish the district attorney's receipt of a material financial benefit as a result of her decision to hire and engage in a romantic relationship with Wade. Simply put, the defendants have not presented sufficient evidence. So he says it twice. He's like, look, it looks weird. This is highly unusual, but there's just not the evidence on the record to conclusively say so. So simply put, the defendants have not presented sufficient evidence indicating that the expenses were not, quote, roughly divided evenly or that the district attorney was or currently remains greatly and pecuniarily, so monetarily, interested in this prosecution. In addition, and much more important, the court finds, based largely on the district attorney's testimony, that the evidence demonstrated that the financial gain flowing from her relationship with Wade was not a motivating factor on the part of the DA to indict and prosecute this case. So, yeah, look, that's a blurred line, right, what's going on with that relationship, but Judge McAfee's saying, but that's not, Wade, Nathan Wade is not the reason she decided to prosecute this case. So whatever those booty calls may have been with those that CSLI data that we didn't get to hear su summary testimony for, whatever was going on between 10 p.m. and 4 a.m., that's not the reason that Fani decided to, to prosecute this case. So while a general motive for more income can never be disregarded entirely, the district attorney was not financially destitute throughout this time or in any great need, as she testified her salary exceeds $200,000 per year without any indication of excessive expenses or debts. Similarly, the court further finds that, I forget, what was, the lien wasn't that much, the lien existed, but it was like 12 grand, right? Something like that. Maybe you guys in the chat have the better recall on that detail. Um, but similarly, because they did try to get her to testify about that. Similarly, the court fi further finds that the defendants have failed to demonstrate that the DA's conduct has impacted or influenced the case to the defendant's detriment. So, the defendant, because remember, Defense has the burden here for disqualification. Defense does not bear the burden for the whole case. The prosecution has to prove their case to the required standard. It's a criminal case. Got to be beyond a reasonable doubt. Um, but for this, this is, I think Judge McAfee was using preponderance of evidence standard, which is a, a lower bar to meet. So here, Judge McAfee is saying, hey, maybe it was, but you guys did not meet your burden to prove that the district attorney's conduct impacted or influenced this case in a way that's bad for your client. While prejudice is not a required element for disqualification, it is relevant to considerations of due process and the defendant's requested remedy of complete dismissal. The defendants argue that the financial arrangement created an incentive to prolong the case, but in fact, there's no indication that the district attorney is interested in delaying anything. Indeed, the record is quite the contrary. Before the relationship came to light, the state requested that the trial begin less than six months after indictment. Soon after, the state opposed severance of the objecting defendants who did not demand their statutory right to a speedy trial. The state argued that it only wanted to try the case once. 
and then that he does know here, assuming that if there's an appeal and it was remanded, the, the appeals would be affirmed. It would hold the conviction. The state amended its proposed timeline in November 2023 to request that the trial commence less than one year after the return of the indictment. And even before the indictment, the district attorney approved a grand jury pre presentment that included fewer defendants than the special purpose grand jury recommended. So basically, they're saying, hey, it doesn't make sense. The state has advocated for keeping the, the calendar moving in the court, and they also shrunk down the number of people that they are moving forward with this indictment. So the scope of it's smaller, that means it'll be a faster case, it'll take less days because you have less people to prosecute, and they're also asking, come on, let's get this moving. So that argument just doesn't make sense with what we can see. In sum, the district attorney has not in any way acted in, in conformance with the theory that she arranged a financial scheme to enrich herself or endear herself to Wade by extending the duration of this prosecution or engaging in excessive litigation. So again, without sufficient evidence, so without that sufficient evidence, here I am, I'm Judge McAfee, and I got to tell you that the district attorney acquired a personal, without sufficient evidence that the DA acquired a personal stake in the prosecution, or that her financial arrangement had any impact on the case, the defendant's claims of actual conflict must be denied. This finding is by no means an indication that the court condones this tremendous lapse. <laughs> so <laughs> he's saying, this is the part he, he probably reads loudly in his head. If this was something, if he used bold text at all, this is probably something that would be bolded. This finding is by no means an indication that the court condones this tremendous lapse in judgment or the unprofessional manner of the district attorney's testimony. So in my courtroom, unprofessional manner of the DA's testimony during the evidentiary hearing. Evidentiary hearing. So the judge is saying, this doesn't condone how you acted in my courtroom. It doesn't condone your lapse in judgment for any of this that, that occurred with your personal relationships, your spending, but also how you acted in my courtroom. <laughs> so that's a call out. That's a legalese call out to from Judge McAfee to Fonnie Willis about that that uh, testimony when she got up on the stand. Rather, it is the undersigned's opinion that Georgia law does not permit the finding. So the letter of the law doesn't let me go further than that. Does not permit the finding of an actual conflict for simply making bad choices, even repeatedly. And it is the trial's, <laughs> it's kind of a personal dig. Oh my God. <laughs> they said repeatedly. Uh, and it is the trial court's duty to confine itself to the relevant issues and applicable law properly bought, brought before it. Other forums or sources of authority. So here, here's other things. Other things. I'm passing the buck. I don't like that you did this. This is a tremendous lapse in judgment. It, it was unprofessional how you came up in my courtroom, funny. But I just, the letter of the law, I can't go further than con just condoning it, than just saying I don't condone it. But there's other forums or sources of authority, such as the General Assembly, the Georgia State Ethics Commission, the State Bar of Georgia. So remember, he's saying here um, the State Ethics Commission because the Fulton County Ethics Commission said, hey, this isn't in our scope. It would have to be the state because she's an officer of the state. So Judge McAfee is properly pointing to the State Ethics Commission. The State Bar of Georgia, the Fulton County Board of Commissioners, or the voters of Fulton County may offer feedback on any unanswered questions that linger, but those are not the issues determinative of the defendant's motion alleging an actual conflict. So not here in this courtroom, not my purview. Now we're getting to appearance of impropriety, and I want to catch up with what some of you guys have said over here. So good morning, Roberta. Happy Friday. And then Myrna says Willis is guilty of sin, bought off judge. This is why he's got to write it carefully, because people are going to say it's bought off, but he that's why we're going to see so many cases listed here. Case, 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 case. So he can say, hey, I'm going to condone it because I'm not going to condone it because I think it looks suspect, but within the letter of the law and how I'm sitting in this seat here, it's it's other venues, it's other authorities that would really be able to the authority to do something about this. So to me, it's like, it's this definitely seems like a split the baby, pass the buck. And then Pam, this is a great question. I think it's another one we can all agree. Who's going to want to take this case? Will Fani try to take this, try this case herself? There'd be fireworks in that courtroom if that happened. I think we would all <laughs> be ready to watch that. Um, 
But I was thinking, you know, I started off today watching the YSL trial, and I was like, oh my gosh, if someone like DA Love comes over, because that's who's prosecuting the YSL trial, and it's a mess. Like, yesterday, she was sparring with the judge. The judge was telling her to shut up. A bailiff had to, like, step up and, like, hit the brakes, lady. And it's just like, who who else? If that's who's prosecuting another major RICO trial. And it's it's fireworks going off in the courtroom, tons of issues. The judge keeps admonishing. The judge is admonishing the defense, too, for certain things. And I think he's a lot more lenient with the state. He's been very generous with the prosecutor. But she's still stepping over lines and and kind of, I don't know, her conduct in court is is very harsh, <laughs> is how I'm going to characterize it. But that's another major RICO case. That's a huge case. And that's the quality of the prosecution. So when Pam asks this question here, who's going to want to take this case? Who will take this case? It's like, what's next? Could it go even worse? Will it be better? Or could it go even worse? <laughs> so... And then Patrick says, a quote, incentive to prolong the case exists because one option is to drop it entirely. The judge is going to get roasted in appeal. And that's going to be interesting to follow. And we have Pantene Pro V in the house. <laughs> so shout out to Pantene. That's a joke stemming from, you know, the Ashley Merchant hair and how Terrence Bradley was under that charm, spilling all of the secrets, all of the tea to Miss Pantene Pro V, Ashley Merchant. So dang, I thought my power combined with Ashley Merchant would be thrown there. <laughs> <laughs> oh my gosh, happy Friday. This is a great way to start it. I love that. <laughs> so we're getting to the appearance of impropriety. So everything so far in this decision has related to, <laughs> has related to an actual conflict, right? Now we're going to talk about the appearance of impropriety, and it's probably where we're going to shift to Wade in the disqualification of Wade. So Finding insufficient evidence of an actual conflict of interest does not end the inquiry. Our appellate courts have endorsed the application of an appearance of impropriety standard to state prosecutors, even without any explicit finding of an actual conflict. And these are the cases, if you guys have been, you know, watching the closing arguments or reading the supplements that were filed after the closing arguments, it's these same cases that both sides were arguing about. Battle versus state. The Greater Georgia Amusements for State. Where is the amusement sales? Amusement sales. We're, we're going to get to Whitworth somewhere, too. Whitworth. Down here. So all of this case law that, you know, the judge was asking Adam Abate about. Um, I think McDougald's was strongly arguing about. Uh, Steve Sadow did some, some serious arguments about this case law. He's referencing all of it in this decision. McAfee's like, here's the letter of the law. And even where it's not explicit you know, appearance is an issue. So these cases cited here that resulted in disqualification did not hold that an actual conflict is a necessary prerequisite. So he's saying doesn't have to be an actual conflict. The state nevertheless argues that the facts presented suggested as much, and while that may be so in some instances, the opinions do not make that finding, and this court cannot ignore the explicit language of the Georgia Supreme Court and multiple opinions from the Georgia Court of Appeals. Further, while Davenport is the first instance this case can find where the exact phrase, quote, appearance of impropriety is used to assess the disqualification of a state prosecutor, the reference to Caesar's wife, ah, we knew it was coming, guys, <laughs> the Caesar's wife, <laughs> and the admonition against all temptation and suspicion demonstrate the principle has long been endorsed in Georgia. While formally undefined in Georgia precedent, an appearance of impropriety is generally considered, quote, conduct or status that would lead a reasonable person to think that the actor is behaving or will be inclined to behave inappropriately or willingly or wrongfully. Borrowing from federal judicial recusal standards, a reasonable person is not an uninformed member of the public with only a passing knowledge of the facts at hand. This must be the standard, as otherwise in this case a casual, uninformed, or misinformed observer might believe the district attorney must recuse herself merely because her father shares a last name with a co-defendant. <laughs> yeah, Floyd. Nor that, that used to confuse me. That was throwing me off when we first started watching the hearings. <laughs> He's calling me out. I'm kidding. I didn't think that was a grounds to dismiss anyone just because a, last, a common last name was shared. Nor is a reasonable person, quote, hypersensitive or unduly suspicious without an understanding of the, quote, relevant legal standards and judicial practice. 
The appearance standard recognizes that even when no actual conflict exists, a perceived conflict in the reasonable eyes of the public threatens confidence in the legal system itself. And that's true. This is us in the chat room, guys, when we're debating, you know, great. We will have like a common agreement on Terrence Bradley, like being the centerpiece. But a lot of us disagree on, you know, should someone having a relationship, does that actually count as a reason that someone should be disqualified? And then when you get to talking and you add in those facts, well, hey, if there was a special contract given out because of that relationship, that's an actual conflict, right? If this contract was rewarded with a direct financial incentive, and there's evidence of it, a reasonable person would say that there's a conflict. But then we all get to you know, up in arms disagreeing, well, is this evidence proven? Is it on the record? Is it enough? Does it actually prove that? Um, and I think a lot of people are in agreement that, Fani, you just... You should have found a different boyfriend or found a different prosecutor, right? But here, Judge McAfee is the one with the question that matters. It doesn't matter what we, we say out here. He's the one that has to make sure he makes a decision that takes into consideration that a perception of conflict could make us out here lose confidence in the legal system itself. So the perception necessarily matters. And he's going to tell us why it matters and what he's doing to kind of remedy. I don't, I don't even want to just say a concern. I think he's, he's agreeing that the public has lost confidence in the legal system because of what this motion pertains to, this disqualification motion pertains to. So when this danger goes uncorrected, it undermines the legitimacy and moral force of our already weakest branch of government. And he quotes a bunch of case law here. This court finds that it can and indeed must consider the appearance of impropriety as a basis for a state prosecutor's disqualification, especially in recognition of the critical role that the prosecutor plays in the criminal justice system. Because remember, us as individuals, the Bill of Rights protects an individual's right to a fair trial. But a prosecutor, the state, the government, their job is to pursue justice, not a win. Not a gotcha, not another notch on the bedpost, we got another conviction. There's the, they're supposed to pursue justice. They bear the overall burden, again, not for the disqualification, the defense bears the burden there, but for the overall outcome of a case. The benefit goes to the defendant. They have the rights to the fair trial. So here, Judge McAfee's saying, Impropriety always has to matter, and we must consider it, because if there's an appearance that a prosecutor is doing something bad, that prosecutor is an agent of the government. They represent the government. The government does not have the freedoms and powers that an individual has. And because a prosecutorial power exists over a defendant, if there's impropriety, the public is necessarily going to question, hey, do people have a fair shot in the criminal justice system. So Judge McAfee has to address this here. So he's going to say that a final observation can be gleaned from a careful study of our appellate decisions applying the standard. The remedy can vary. So we have to consider the appearance of impropriety, but the remedy can vary. So this is going to get us down to, you know, does the whole prosecutor office, is everyone off? If there is an impropriety, is it everybody? Can it just be one person? What happens next? If we think there's impropriety, what are we supposed to do to provide a remedy for it? This is where he's going to explain, hey, it's not dictated with an explicit course of action. The remedy can vary, and I'm going to tell you the decision I came to for this remedy. Unlike an actual conflict, the finding of an appearance of impropriety does not automatically demand disqualification. Our Supreme Court has previously analyzed disqualification under an appearance standard in a civil case using a continuum, recognizing that disqualification is not always the appropriate outcome. So there's case law here. He's saying there's case law here that, you know, this, if it's impropriety, doesn't mean that everybody has to be disqualified automatically. They quote here, at one end of the scale where disqualification is always justified and indeed mandated, even when balanced against a client's right to an attorney of choice, is the appearance of impropriety coupled with a conflict of interest or jeopardy to a client's confidences. So the defendant, 
In these instances, it is clear that the disqualification is necessary for the protection of the client. Somewhere in the middle of the continuum is the appearance of impropriety based on conduct on the part of the attorney. As discussed above, this generally has been found insufficient to outweigh the client's interest in counsel of choice. This is probably so because absent danger to the client, the nebulous interest of the public at large in the propriety of the bar is not, so the legal profession, is not weighty enough to justify disqualification. Finally, at the opposite end of the continuum is the appearance of propriety based not on conduct but on status alone. This is insufficient grounds for disqualification. So here he has the legal precedent here to say, I don't have to find full disqualification. I'm not required to. The Supreme Court further noted that disqualification due to an appearance of impropriety should rarely occur, where there is no danger that the actual trial of the case will, will be tainted. So this is why he opened this motion, at the or this order. At the beginning of this order, he said, hey, look, the defendant, the defendants failed to prove that even if there's an actual conflict, even if there's an appearance of, of a conflict of interest, the defense who bears the burden for this motion did not provide sufficient evidence to suggest that this relationship or any of this impropriety would be detrimental to the case of any of the defendants. So McAfee said, hey, it could be, but you didn't provide that evidence to me, so I've got nothing to rule otherwise. And then he cites a bunch of case law. He mentions that in Billings v. State, although the Court of Appeals found the existence of an appearance of impropriety, it noted that the appearance could be cured through screening the affected prosecutor from participation or discussion of the affected case. These cases indicate that a trial court can consider alternative solutions. So I have, the precedent gives me the room to consider alternative solutions to cure the appearance of impropriety. So Judge Mc McAfee, yes, there's impropriety here. I'm not sure the state has given me, or the defense has given me enough to say there's no way I cannot disqualify Fani. And I'm not required to, and precedent says I should be conservative about making a decision like that. Especially if it doesn't, if it hasn't been proven that it's to detriment of the defense. But I want to do something about it. <laughs> so, in my reading of this, and you can disagree, Judge McAfee is like, God, this is a mess. This is really bad. But I don't want to make too extreme of a decision. And guess what? Precedent allows me to kind of find somewhere in between. That's how I'm reading what Judge McAfee is is how he's coming to his final judgment here. So nor would the finding of an appearance of impropriety on the part. Actually, let me see what you guys are saying here, because that was a lot. And then Roberta saying she's mad and embarrassed. I think Fani, right? But it still doesn't excuse her attitude in court. So probably talking about Fani. Trump folks better buckle up, because if it were me, I wouldn't take any prisoners or leave any DNA or evidence. <laughs> so, so you're saying, because... Because of all of this, right, Fani's going to come in scorched earth now more than ever before, right? Is that how I'm taking this? <laughs> Every stone's going to be unturned because now this is like, what was it? Hell hath no fury like a scorned woman, right? So her, because of this relationship becoming public, she had to deal with Nathan. I didn't get the impression that she's very fond of Nathan Wade just by how they were, and maybe I shouldn't read the body language. But if she's not fond of Nathan Wade, but she had to sit there <laughs> while closing arguments were going on, she had to sit two feet away from him or had to watch him on the stand talk about her. I think you're saying she's going to come in and go scorched earth now, right? Like pedal to the metal. <laughs> so you might be right. Let's see. She did try to find someone else. They all said no. I think she only asked two people, right? Two other people. But I don't, I don't blame people for not wanting to, to, to take the case, especially the one, the first guy she asked was, he's like, I'm already retired. I'm not coming back out of, back out to do this. Um, and especially it's going to be a long trial. Forget the case, the nature of the case. It's a big celebrity case. It could be a huge headache, but it would be a long trial. So if you agree to it, you're committing for two years. And then good morning, Barbara. <laughs> and then... Let's see. Patrick says, except the rarest of cases. Gee, isn't that description of this case? That is a valid point. That's a very valid point. And hopefully, honestly, hopefully this stays rare. Right? <laughs> hopefully we don't keep, there's no pattern of this emerging. 
And then Lorraine says, why was Wade with her at the interview with the attorney who was Will's, Will's first choice? Right, because he was like part of the, the hiring team. I wonder, I wonder who he was billing for that and how he described that line item of what that meeting was. Oh, this is work for the meeting where we're going to hire me eventually anyway. <laughs> I'm going to bill for my time to help you hire someone. Just so I can get hired. <laughs> Oops. And then Pantene says, I wonder if the new legislation signed by Governor Kemp on DAs will play a role in all of this. Right? So, guys, there's been so many rumblings. Like, and again, this is like a short time period. Ashley Merchant brought this forward in, in like January. So, of course, things are going to be moving fast because it, the door kind of opened recently. But at the same time, if these things were in place to try to move before this decision was made, as one, maybe a fail-safe if Judge McAfee decides not to disqualify Fani or anybody, right? Because this decision could have been no disqualification at all. Um, but all these other moving parts, right? That could also give Judge McAfee, like, I don't know, do you guys think that some of the other stuff gave Judge McAfee the opportunity to just, like, take a deep breath and say, all right, I can relax and not have to weigh making an extreme decision on one side or the other. I don't need to be the one to make this decision, and I'm going to kind of just bring it here and let someone else deal with it. Because as Pantene is pointing out, you know, this, whatever's going on with Governor Kemp, that could be another different authority that could make the decision that Judge McAfee says, hey, I'm not supposed to make this one. So, and then sounds like they have to sacrifice the bishop to keep the queen on the board. Just not checkers. <laughs> Elisa gives her a good reason to give him a shove out the door with... Right? So imagine... Imagine your relationship ends, and then you have to sit in the courtroom together. <laughs> and then the judge kicks him out for you. <laughs> That's drama, man. It's reality TV right there. If having an affair doesn't show one's lack of sense of, of reasonableness, then I don't know what does. And that's the thing. Judge McAfee is saying here, like, Fani, you're making bad decision. Poor judgment. You're doing this repeatedly. But someone else has the authority to do something about it, whether that's um, the Georgia State Ethics Commission or, uh, you know, the, the bar. It's somebody else. Somebody else has the authority to do something about it. But he made sure he said it. He's, I think it looks really bad. I can't excuse that. But it's not on me, guys. This is kind of where we are. And then, nor would, it, nor would the finding of an appearance of impropriety on the part of the DA, in contrast to an actual conflict, necessarily result in the disqualification of the entire Fulton County District Attorney's Office. So if we didn't know the news, right? If we didn't, we know from this reading only, right? Ignore, you didn't see my thumbnail, you didn't see what this was called, you just came into here and you're like, all right, I'm just going to read the motion from scratch knowing nothing. I'm a blank slate about today's news. We heard at the beginning of the motion, Judge McAfee saying, I'm denying the full dismissal, but I'm granting this this motion in part, in, in parts. And here we're looking, we're waiting to fee see what those parts are. We don't know that he's going to disqualify Nathan Wade yet. As soon as you get to this line, the appearance of impropriety wouldn't necessarily result in the disqualification of the entire Fulton County District Attorney's Office. Right here. Right here, it's going to be clear. He's going to disqualify Somebody. Somebody. But not everybody. The district attorney in McLaughlin. And thank you so much, Pantene Pro. I'm going to use this $10. <laughs> I don't have much hair. One bottle of Pantene would last me a very long time. <laughs> I'm going to use this $10. I'm going to get some Pantene. I'm going to go out and about. And I'm going to be like, hey, do you want to tell me some tea on this case for my YouTube channel? <laughs> You want to smell my hair? <laughs> you want to tell me something in confidence? So thank you so much. And thank you so much for doing this all with the Pantene Pro V picture. It's making my day. <laughs> and then, yeah, so what we're reading, I'm making a hypothetical that we're pretending we didn't see the news report. So I, you might have missed the thumbnail, but they did. Judge McAfee is, Wade's got to go. Wade cannot stay. But Willis can stay. The case can move forward as of now, whatever. Um, so if you hear me mentioning other moving parts, 
those I'm talking about things outside of the courtroom, outside of Judge McAfee. And Judge McAfee in this motion, if you were missing that little part, Eliza, Judge McAfee underscores, hey, other authorities out there can still do something to make a decision on, on Fonnie Willis, further action. But it's not me. It's not going to be me. And then let's see. Where was I? All right, so we're back here. Necessarily results in the disqualification of the entire Fulton County District Attorney's Office. The District Attorney in McLaughlin was absolutely disqualified due to a personal interest in the prosecution. So I guess here he's saying in this case, yeah, they disqualified the District Attorney, um, but there was unequivocally no doubt that there was a personal interest in the prosecution, which Judge McAfee's saying he didn't find evidence of here. Uh, or the defense didn't meet their burden of sufficient evidence for him to make that decision. As a result, assistant district attorneys appointed by the district attorney lacked any authority to proceed. Um, McLaughlin did not address an appearance standard and made a point to limit the total disqualification to instances of absolute disqualification. So he is justifying why he's not going to just disqualify the entire Fulton County District Attorney's Office from this case. When the appearance of conflict exists, only the affected prosecutor, be they elected or appointed. Now remember, <laughs> he's he's making a, a point out here. He's pushing back. This was a huge, huge thing um, that Adam Abate in closing arguments. And then I think that supplement was written by Fonnie Willis. Personally, I think she ran out of the courtroom and said, I got to clean up this poor, unenergetic, weak closing argument that my guy Adam Abate delivered. I had to give him two post-its during his closing argument. I think she went out and wrote that supplement. But she highlighted over and over and over and over in that supplement, or whoever wrote it, elected. Fonnie Willis was elected. Elected, elected, elected. And here, Judge is specifying only the affected prosecutor, whether they're elected or appointed, it really doesn't matter. So even though you mentioned that you were elected 32 different times in that motion, it, it was unnecessary. <laughs> it doesn't matter. You're misunderstanding what the case law says if you think it matters that you were elected. Um, so, cite some other case law here. And then, with these principles in mind, the court finds that the record made at the evidentiary hearing established that the district attorney's prosecution is encumbered by an appearance of impropriety. So, he's saying, yep, with the record, with the evidence that was prevent presented, the defense did demonstrate that there is an appearance of impropriety going on with, with, with the DA here. This appearance is not created by mere status alone, but comes because of specific conduct and impacts more than a mere nebulous public interest because it concerns a public prosecutor. So it's not inconsequential. Um, even if the romantic relationship began after Wade's initial contract in November 2021, the district attorney, attorney chose to continue supervising and paying Wade while maintaining such a relationship. She further allowed the regular and loose exchange of money between them without an exact or verifiable measure of reconciliation. This is this is the scolding, right? And it's 15 pages in, and it's not really going to... We know that she's not getting disqualified, so it's just a scolding for Fani. But it's going to serve as a basis a little bit for why Wade has to go. She further allowed the regular and loose... So Fani further allowed the regular and loose exchange of money between them without an exact or verifiable measure of reconciliation. This lack, this lack of a confirmed financial split creates the possibility and appearance that the district attorney benefited, albeit non-materially, from a contract whose award lay solely within her purview and policing. So nobody can, you can't pass the buck to your accountants or the other employees. Fani, this was yours to, to police. And he's already stated earlier in this, this this motion, this order, he's like, look, <laughs> you've made bad decisions. You've used poor judgment repeatedly. So this is a scolding to Fani, but the remedy is going to adversely affect Nathan Wade. Most importantly, were the case allowed to proceed unchanged, the prima facie concerns raised by the defendants would persist. As the district attorney testified, her relationship with Wade was only cemented after these motions and is stronger than ever. Oh, what? I don't get that vibe. I think she was just saying that personally. Wade's patently unpersuasive explanation for the inaccurate interrogatories he submitted. Let's talk about that. Because <laughs> she did say that. Like, yeah, they're broken up or whatever. But with these motions, 
her relationship with Wade, outside of them not talking and having like a sexual relationship anymore, has only been cemented after these motions. These motions to disqualify and dismiss the case. And it's stronger than ever. If you guys watched the closing arguments and you remember seeing Fannie Willis um, and then one of the uh, other, I think it was like an ADA sitting between them or maybe it was counsel for Nathan Wade. And then Nathan Wade, they're sitting like one person apart. If you watched that, let me know what you thought of their body language and their their demeanor. <laughs> and just, just let me know your guess, your guesstimate on if you really agree. And Fannie might believe this, but let's look at it in terms of Nathan Wade. <laughs> Do you think Nathan Wade would think that his relationship with Fannie is stronger than ever today? at least in February, than it ha ever had been. What do you think about that? <laughs> but let me keep going. Yeah, um, this is that's how I felt. They pretended that the other didn't. They were very much... <laughs> <laughs> so Wade's patently unpersuasive explanation. <laughs> patently. It's so unpersuasive. <laughs> Wade's patently unpersuasive explanation. So they're talking about his testimony, Nathan Wade's testimony. Nate's patently unpersuasive explanation for the inaccurate interrogatories he submitted in his pending divorce. So his income, when he said he only had like $2,000 in his bank account, uh, like he grossly underrepresented his, his monthly income. We know that he was getting, by the time he's been dealing with this, this divorce paperwork, he had previously been making $550 an hour when he was working to investigate the Cobb County prisons, where he came up with that report that the work product was all in his head. Um, he was working on that. Then he comes over. He has his private practice. Then he gets this this contract where he's making $250 an hour with this block billing where it's not exactly clear what he's invoicing his allotted hours for. But he's in, in his divorce filings. He's like, I'm pretty much broke. I've got debt and I'm broke. I've only got $2,000, even though, like, you know, with my Cobb County work, it would take me less than four hours to make that $2,000 in my bank account. Joycelyn Wade's uh, divorce attorney, she did an interview where she was saying, you know, he didn't, we, we wanted, you know, we don't have any indication that he has retirement accounts, stocks. So this man is either in his 40s and in a professional field that, you know, talks a lot about finances, he's a business owner, right? When you're a business owner, you, ha you have to think about finances. He keeps his reports in his head while he's investigating prison deaths, which is like kind of messed up, right? That's not when someone's investigating something like people dying in prison and you hear that they're getting paid $550 an hour for it. And their work product is the brainchild in their head. He doesn't have documents or anything like that. That's what he said in an interview before he was hired to prosecute this Trump Rico case. Um, then he goes into his divorce against someone he's been married to for decades. That he ends up accusing of cheating on him, which, ma which matters in Georgia. So Georgia, you know, uh, infidelity is a grounds for divorce, but it also affects what division of assets goes where if you cheated on me it's going to help me get more alimony from you it's going to be a more favorable division of assets than it could have been if you didn't cheat on me so wade is going into this divorce case saying hey <laughs> i'm like broke <laughs> yeah i don't have any documents to show you about assets that I have, like an IRA or any retirement accounts that you would think anyone in their 40s, you're either stupid for making that much money and not putting anything aside for retirement, which is your own choice, right? Um, but usually most people that don't have any retirement savings, it's because they're living paycheck to paycheck, but you're getting paid $550 an hour. So to me, it just seems fishy that you're going into your divorce case. Oh, I don't got any retirement accounts. I don't have any stocks. I don't have any assets. We have the house. <laughs> Uh, we have a house and two cars, and I only have $2,000 total to my name when I was making that much money an hour just months ago. So, Joycelyn Wade's attorney, it seems to be going bananas, and good for her. Like, poor Joycelyn Wade in all of this. Imagine finding out you've been a stay-at-home, like, homemaker 
kids go off to school. The day after your husband gets a new contract, he files divorce paperwork against you. He gets his contract on November 1st. Then he files divorce paperwork on November 2nd. <laughs> and then in his, his paperwork, in his interrogatories for the divorce, he's like, I don't got any money. Sorry. But then you find out all of the receipts. He's taking these trips, which, yeah, whatever. People take vacations, right? But you did kind of take, like, four. And thank you so much, Roberta. That's so nice. You don't have to send any super chats, but that is so kind of you. So blessings to you all as well. And I'm so glad that you're here. And, you know, I just, I got really mad thinking about what Joycelyn Wade's got to be going through. She's accused of cheating. She's being told that by her husband in this litigation that he's broke. And then you hear, you get to see, imagine Joycelyn Wade, like, I don't know when she ended up coming across the information, but you start seeing these Capital One records. He's going on vacation after vacation. It was like five trips in a seven month period. But you know, we can go on vacation once a year. It's nice. Treat yourself. But if you're telling me you're broken a divorce and you're going on these trips and I can see the Capital One records and then you're accusing me of cheating on you and you tell me you only have $2,000, but you made all this money somewhere else. That is wild. And I'm honestly glad that it is a point that Judge McAfee is going to hold against Nathan Wade. Nathan Wade's just not a regular person that's getting a divorce from his wife and trying to, you know, avoid alimony. He's an attorney and he knows better. Right? It wouldn't be okay for someone to kind of like act like, you know, you're supposed to be honest when you put forth that type of stuff in litigation when you answer interrogatories. So it'd be an issue for even a lay person. But you're an attorney and you know better. You know way better than this. And I'm, I'm really glad that Judge McAfee is calling it out because I think it's kind of messed up the position that Joycelyn Wade is in with all of this. And yeah, I think he treated his, his wife wickedly. And then she's got to deal with the press about it. So as much as I don't think Terrence Bradley was genuine when he said, um, you know, the reason I want to speak and spill all the tea to Pantene, <laughs> to Miss Pantene, Ashley Merchant, the reason I want to spill all the tea to Ashley Merchant is because I don't like the way he treated his wife, Joycelyn. And maybe he's fond of Joycelyn and maybe that's a part of it. I'm just saying, I think, I think there's other reasons uh, Terrence Bradley had a, an axe to grind with Nathan Wade, maybe Fani, who knows? Because remember, he was also contracted to do taint team work for Fulton County. So there could be issues directly with Fani Willis, not just a uh, axe to grind with Nathan Wade when it comes to Terrence Bradley. Um, but I do think even though he may not have been that genuine, it may have been something that he was saying to give an excuse to Ashley why he's spilling the tea without saying the real reason he's spilling the tea. I, th I think it's still valid on its face, even if it wasn't his genuine reason that Joycelyn Wade was treated really badly in all of this. And guys, there's an interview out there. I want to say, I don't think it was 11 Alive. I think it was one of the, the local syndicates, like Fox 5 Atlanta, maybe, where Joycelyn's attorney and, and uh, lead attorney and AV to the seventh power broke this down in a live stream. It's probably more entertaining to watch than just the interview itself. But her attorney is not giving up the fight. They're looking for more records. Well, they want to see IRS paperwork. They want to see some of these other financial records. Uh, her attorney has made her own public records requests for some of the same things that Ashley Merchant was able to uncover through public records. Um, so the battle is not ending here for, for Nathan Wade. He's going to get disqualified from this special prosecution, special prosecution. And then everything that came forward in this motion to disqualify has lit a fire over in his divorce case. And he should have known better from the start because he never should have sat in his interrogatories and said, hey, I'm submitting this paperwork where I only have $2,000. He did it to himself. So let's look at Judge McAfee calling it out. So most importantly, were the case, were the case allowed to proceed unchanged, the prima facie concerns raised by the defendant would persist. As the district attorney testified, her relationship with Wade has only cemented after these, and I just, I don't think you guys are agreeing with that, right? They, I agree with Barbara. They looked like they didn't want anything to do with each other in that closing argument hearing. Wade's patently unpersuasive explanation for the inaccurate interrogatories he submitted in his pending divorce indicates a willingness on his part to wrongly conceal his relationship with the district attorney. So he has a divorce case. There's obviously a personal and financial incentive for him to 
lie to this court and then in, in to the tribunal that's dealing with his divorce. He lied in those interrogatories. In legalese, Judge McAfee's saying, you lied. <laughs> so as the case moves forward, reasonable members of the public could easily be left to wonder whether the financial exchanges have continued resulting in some form of benefit to the district attorney or even whether the romantic relationship has resumed. That's why he's putting these quotes here. I think they hate each other, but you know, some, some couples do go through fiery fights and then they get back together and it is stronger than ever. So maybe Fani, <laughs> let me know if you think Fani and Willis will rekindle things. But differently, an outsider could reasonably think that the district attorney is not exercising her independent professional judgment, totally free of any compromising influences. As long as Wade remains on the case, this unnecessary perception will persist. So Fani, you did things wrong, but we can remedy this by just getting rid of Wade. Kick him out. The testimony introduced, including that the district attorney and Wade, did not put these concerns to rest. During argument, so your testimony, including your own, Fonnie Willis and, and Wade, your testimony didn't help. <laughs> During argument, the defendant's focus largely pivoted from the financial concerns to disproving the testimony of the district attorney, namely that her romantic relationship actually predated the November 21st hiring, November 2021 hiring of Wade. On that front, the court makes a few brief observations. First, and this is where he's going to lay out why the defendant's shift in strategy impacted his decision. First, the court finds itself unable to, to place any stock in the testimony of Terrence Bradley. <laughs> so there we go. We knew this was coming. Can't trust Terrence Bradley. Just can't do it. His inconsistencies, demeanor, and generally non-responsive answers left far too brittle a foundation upon which to build any conclusions. While prior inconsistent statements can be considered as substantive evidence under Georgia law, Bradley's impeachment by text message did not establish the basis for which he claimed such sweeping knowledge of Wade's personal affairs. So this is a footnote here that isn't just case law. Let's look down here. For that reason, the courts finds it necessary to reopen the evidence to consider the testimony. Oh, okay. So he did. So he, he, Judge McAfee opened the record. Okay, so let's see. Bradley's impeachment by text message did not establish the basis for which he claimed such sweeping knowledge of Wade's personal affairs. For that reason, this footnote, the court finds it unnecessary to... Oh, so he's not opening it. Okay. I was like, why would he make this decision? I read an important word wrong, guys. My bad. I was like, why would he make this decision and then say he's going to open this up? So he's saying the court finds it unnecessary to reopen the evidence to consider the testimony of Cindy Yeager or Manny Aurora, as proffered by Defendant Schaefer and Latham, respectively. Now, this, within this motion to disqualify, we'll probably see this as uh, an appeal argument, particularly from Schaefer and Latham for their clients. Um, you know, they're going to write these things out. We can take a look at them. Um, but they did proffer these two witnesses. Um, and I think, yeah, Schaefer was, was Jaeger, and then Latham proffered Manny Aurora. So they will probably make their own independent appeal argument about, you know, one for Cindy Jaeger and one for Manny Aurora. So, because it was proffered, and he said, well, it can't come in. So we probably haven't heard the last of that, but whether we'll get any more than what was in those affidavits... In addition, while the testimony of Robert Nearty raised doubts about the state's assertions, it ultimately lacked context and detail. Even after considering the proffered cell phone testimony from Donald from Defendant Trump, along with the entirety of the other evidence, neither side was able to conclusively establish by a preponderance of the evidence, which is not a high bar like beyond reasonable doubt, right? So he's saying here that um, the defense, specifically Steve Sadow, in relation to the CSLI evidence that Steve Sadow wanted to bring in, um, you weren't able to conclusively establish by a preponderance of the evidence when the relationship evolved into a romantic one. So he considered that CSLI, but he's saying here that CSLI data isn't enough to even conclusively establish by a preponderance of the evidence when the relationship evolved into a romantic one. CSLI testimony is not enough for a preponderance of the evidence standard. What's the implication of that for criminal cases where CSLI data is introduced 
as evidence to meet a beyond reasonable doubt standard of proof. It's a little line here, but it's a pretty big line. However, an odor of mendacity remains, so it stinks. <laughs> the court is not under an obligation to ferret out. He chose a stinky animal. <laughs> Because ferrets stink. Why is he, he's like evoking metaphors about ferrets. The court is not under an obligation to ferret out every instance of potential dishonesty from each witness or defendant ever presented in open court. So I didn't have to bring in all this stuff and let it all get on the record in completeness. Such an expectation would mean an end to the efficient disposition of criminal and civil proceedings. Yet reasonable questions about whether district attorney and her hand-selected Nathan Wade testified untruthfully about the timing of their relationship further underpin the finding of an appearance of impropriety and the need to make proportional efforts to cure it. So I don't think the defense did enough to even meet the preponderance of evidence standard, right? So we just need to see, like, could this be reasonably true? Did the defense prove this? But yet Judge McAfee is saying, I think it's reasonable if people say that Fani and Nathan testified untruthfully about the timing of their relationship. It's totally reasonable. Uh, but he's looking for proportional efforts to cure or remedy the appearance of impropriety, either way. Ultimately, dismissal of the indictment is not the appropriate remedy to adequately dissipate the financial cloud of impropriety and potential untruthfulness found here. He has a bunch of case law. There has not been a showing. So defense hasn't shown the evidence, sufficient evidence, that, that the defendant's due process rights have been violated or that the issues involve prejudice the defendants in any way. So there isn't a big enough consequence on the other end of this remedy for me to decide and rule that I'm going to make a more extreme remedy. So because of that, I can't just dis dismiss this whole case, for one. And two, who are we going to disqualify? Because it's not going to be everybody. So, nor is this qualification of a constitutional officer, so Fannie Willis, necessary when a less drastic and sufficiently remedial option is available. So getting rid of Wade is enough. The court therefore concludes that the prosecution of this case cannot proceed until the state selects one of two options. The district attorney may choose to step aside, so Fanny could still step aside, along with the whole of her office, and refer the prosecution to the prosecuting attorney's counsel for reassignment. Um, do you think that that's going to happen? I do not, because that's what they wanted to avoid in the first place, right? We don't want this case to go to somewhere else besides Fanny's Fulton County's district attorney's office. Alternatively, uh, Nathan Wade can withdraw, allowing the district attorney, the defendants, and the public to move forward without his presence or rem remuneration, oh, words beat me up, distracting from and potentially compromising the merits of this case. So the whole office can step aside or Wade has to go make the decision. Which one? <laughs> we already know which one was made. Then we're going to talk about the forensic misconduct. So Georgia Supreme Court, and that's very slick of Judge McAfee. <laughs> He's saying, hey, I'm not deciding that you need to step aside. I'm not deciding just to disqualify Nathan Wade. I'm telling you, those are your two options. Pick one. And obviously, you can you can guess that Fannie Willis does not seem like the type of person that wants to give up when she willingly went up and testified so she could stay on this case, right? So logic would say, let me get rid of Wade. And we were at that point now. We know from the news reports that the decision chosen was, yep, Nathan's going to be gone. Forensic misconduct. So the Georgia Supreme Court also reckoned, let me actually see what you guys are saying. <laughs> By Terrence Chatty Patty. He gets a, an endorsement deal from the York Peppermint Patties, and it's just, <laughs> it's just like, like a speech bubble is the new branding for all of their, their package wraps. Every time you open a wrapper, there's a juicy piece of tea. <laughs> Reading between the judge's words, Bradley is a gossipy bitch. That's, I, it, that is kind of like what he's saying in more legally acceptable terms. And that doesn't sound like this judge ever took a class in statistics or probability theory. You know, I did think it was kind of weird that he, he threw in that, um, I mean, he's, he's kind of mentioned the preponderance thing more than once, but I think it's really, where was it? It was up here. Yeah, over here. <laughs> he had to address it. He had to put this in his decision. He had to mention 
that he did not find the CSLI summary testimony uh, brought forward by Steve Sadow on behalf of defendant Donald Trump. He had to say, like, hey, I considered it, but it wasn't conclusive enough to meet that preponderance of evidence standard. That's a really low bar to set when that data is used in criminal cases that are held to a higher standard. There are plenty of cases in Fulton County where the cell phone data is what makes or breaks a, a prosecution's argument in a case. And here you have Judge McAfee saying, eh, it's not even enough for a preponderance of evidence, sorry. Um, and to be fair, to be fair, let me clarify one thing there. The defense doesn't have the same power to execute subpoenas to take devices, right? And that's another issue. If you watch the YSL trial, um, some of the evidence that came forward was from a direct seizure of Jeffrey Williams' young thug cell phone. But then there was an argument that was made that that uh, cell phone seizure was fruit of the poisonous tree. The warrant wasn't lawfully um, signed. There wasn't. It wasn't justified. It wasn't uh, executed properly. And anything that precipitates down from, you know, a bad warrant, a poor search and seizure can't use it in trial, can't use it, fruit of the poisonous tree. So it creates a separate issue once you are trying to get someone's device. But the state has greater power to get a warrant. They can get warrants. They don't need to just subpoena things. They can get warrants. And they can go and obtain devices. And when you have a device, that's more information. You can extract more information from a device when you have it in your possession then you can extract from, you know, AT&T cell phone records. So there is a, a distinction here with Steve Sadow. We were not, we, they did not have Fonnie Willis's phone. They didn't have Nathan Wade's phone, right? So that is kind of important context to consider here. But still, CSLI data, there's plenty of cases that deal with cell phone tower pings where they don't have that physical device either. And here we're saying it's not good enough for preponderance of the evidence. That's rough when you consider how many cases depend on cell phone tower pings in criminal in the criminal uh, realm. This is just for disqualification, where the defense bears the burden. <sighs> I feel like he probably didn't want to have to address that, but he has to. And then, hey, Cryptician, so glad to see you. And yes, I love talking about reactions versus the reality of things, right? Um, partly here, right? Today we're talking about, you know... He makes his decision. Nathan Wade gets kicked off. That's a big deal. But then we can talk about, all right, who comes next? Is it going to be better or worse? Right? The reactions in reaction to the legal filings can be so big and important. So thanks for joining, Cryptician. But yeah. Yeah, Wade put his money under Fanny's pillow. <laughs> yeah, she said she had a lot of cash sitting around. I'm not sure that'd be a very comfortable pillow to sleep on. Although, who would be picky? <laughs> like, if the two three wants to leave 15 grand under my pillow, well, I'd be happy. I'll sleep with my neck crooked. It's fine. Ultimately, dismissal of the indictment is not the appropriate remedy to adequately dissipate the financial cloud. I think I was a little bit further. There's not been a showing that the defendant's due process rights have been violated. So the defense didn't prove their, their burden here. Um, that the due process rights of the defendants have been violated or that the issues involve prejudice the defendants in any way nor is disqualification of a constitutional officer necessary when a less drastic and sufficiently remedial option is available. The court therefore concludes that the prosecution of this case cannot proceed until the state selects one of two options. Oh, I've read this whole thing. I'm sorry. But yeah, he gives the choices. <laughs> but we did get that, uh, that thing. You know, disqualification, because Fani is a constitutional officer. I'm not going to make one of those options be that she has to withdraw herself. I'm going to give her an out. Forensic misconduct. I'm down here somewhere. Right? Well, let's see. Sorry, guys. I spun my own wheels off, off the track. The Georgia Supreme Court also recognizes forensic misconduct or improper comment by the state as grounds for disqualification. One example of such forensic... I think he expects... Um, he's expecting the public to read this if he's putting this, this comma here or improper comment. Right, because when you hear the term forensic misconduct, I think a lot of people jump to those shows like, um, like CSI, 
right? Forensic misconduct. It, you think that the misconduct is how we're looking at DNA evidence and we're doing some type of misconduct while we're doing it. I think he's he's writing this for the public, for sure, if he's putting this comma to define what forensic misconduct is. Because the state and the, the attorneys who are making motions arguing for it clearly know what forensic misconduct means. This type of definition is for us out here, because he expects this decision to be read by the public. By the state as grounds for disqualification. One example of such forensic misconduct is, quote, expression by the prosecuting attorney of his personal belief in the defendant's guilt. Then he has the case law here as guidance. Williams, so is Williams versus State? Yeah, Williams or State instructs that the trial court should, quote, take into consideration whether such remarks were part of a calculated plan evincing a design to prejudice the defendant in the minds of the jurors, or whether such remarks were inadvertent utterances. So um, I think Steve Sadow quoted this specifically, this, this sentence here. The calculated plan evincing a design. I think he said it in closing arguments. Williams also notes that while the prosecutor's comments may be considered improper, they must be egregiously, egregious, so to justify disqualification. So he's saying, hey, yeah, this this quote from that case law, Steve Sadal, is great, but there's an extra layer here. It has to be egregious. So those remarks could have sort of prejudiced the defendant, and it may have been calculated, that church speech. But was it egregious? Is what Judge McAfee is, is poking away at here. This court has not located nor been provided with, so defense hasn't provided us the sufficient evidence here. A single additional, or case law, a single additional case exploring the relevant standard for forensic misconduct, or an opinion that actually resulted in disqualification under Georgia law. Left unexplored, therefore, is how, oft, how other examples of forensic misconduct can manifest, such as whether statements that stop short of commenting on the guilt of a defendant can be disqualifying. Nor has it ever been decided if some showing of prejudice is required and how a trial sh court should go about determining whether such prejudice exists. Nor is it clear whether the analysis differs depending on the pretrial posture of the case. Unmoored from precedent, precedent, the court feels confined. So I can't go outside this precedent, guys. The court feels con confined to the boundaries of Williams and restricts the application of the facts found here to its limited holding. So if it's not egregious, I can't, I can't do anything. The defendants have exhaust exhaustively documented every public comment made by the, the district attorney. And that's that's true. You have, listen, when you have this many co-defendants, that's like, you've got a lot more manpower, right? You've got a lot more manpower. And, you know, this is a higher profile case, right? So you have people that probably have more money at their disposal. Um, they're crowdfunding for their, to pay for their attorneys. You've got all this manpower. So here, McAfee's saying, you guys have exhaustively documented every public comment made by Fonnie Willis concerning this case through their motions and supplemental filings. Many of these have already been addressed through a pretrial challenge. So we've already talked about this stuff. Not us, but Judge McAfee and these co-defendants attorneys. We've already addressed a lot of this through a pretrial challenge made on similar grounds brought by defendants Trump and Latham. This court incorporates and adopts the sound reasoning of Judge McBurney and finds that any comments made by the DA prior to July 31st, 2023, did not amount to disqualifying forensic misconduct. So that's the grand jury time period. Public comments about the need for and importance of the investigation fall far short of the type of bias, explicit or implicit, that must be found. Similarly, more recent comments, so we're fast forwarding to like this church speech, Describing the charges in the indictment, the procedural posture of the case, the office's conviction rates, and personal behind-the-scenes anecdotes are not disqualifying. This includes the district attorney's unorthodox decision. So remember, Judge McAfee keeps saying, Fani, you keep repeatedly using poor judgment. He's saying it here. This includes the district attorney's unorthodox decision to make on-the-record comments and authorize members of her staff to do likewise two authors intent on publishing a book about the special grand jury's investigation during the pendency of this case. Such decisions may have an ancillary prejudicial effects yet to be realized, but the comments do not rise to the level of disqualification under Williams. Ancillary prejudicial effects yet to be realized. There's no precedent for me to say this rises to the level of disqualification. But, listen, 
it's probably not the end of it. And when you have multiple co-defendants with their attorneys and all of those attorneys' legal teams and all of the manpower, they will look at every possible ancillary prejudicial effect and they will make issue of it. They will make issue of it through motions during the active trial case. And if they do not get the outcome at the end of trial that they want, you will likely see this, this book, these statements, the church speech, they will be raised as a prejudicial issue on appeal. So McAfee's saying, it doesn't, I'm not going to do anything, but it's not going to end here. It's just not, I'm not the one that can do anything. This is like a common theme now. Like I think every section of this, this whole uh, order that we're reading, you kind of see this pattern where he's like, it's not enough for me. But Fani, that was a dumb decision. And even though I can't, I'm not going to do anything. I can't do anything about it. I'm constrained. Someone else has the authority to just saying. That's been the that's been the theme. I don't think we've really gotten through a section of this where Judge McAfee hasn't had that kind of sentiment weaved through. Then again, that could just be my perception, my reading, to be fair. The same cannot so easily be said of the district attorney's prepared speech delivered before the congregation of a local Atlanta church on January 14th, 2024. In these public and televised comments, the district attorney complained that a Fulton County commissioner, quote, and so many others, questioned her decision to hire Wade. When referencing in her, to her detractors throughout the speech, she frequently utilized the plural, they. The state, and think about what they said during closing arguments. Um, Steve St. Allen McDougald, they. We knew who they meant. We knew who they referenced. So Mac McAfee has to respond to their arguments about the use of the word they and who that referred to. The state argues the speech was not aimed at any of the defendants in this case. Maybe so, but maybe not. Therein lies the danger of public comment by a prosecuting attorney. So why would you do this? That's poor judgment. Funny. Like, stop it. This is a, this is a finger wave. This is a, this is a finger wave in legalese at Fonnie Willis. By including a reference to, quote, so many others on the heels of Defendant Roman's motion, which instigated the entire controversy. So Ashley Merchant's motion. Remember, she's representing Roman. The district attorney left open the question for the public to consider. So the public confidence issue. The court finds, after considering the statement as a whole, under all the circumstances surrounding its issuance, that the district attorney's speech did include defendant Roman and his counsel within its ambit, whether intentional or not. And we have a footnote here. Worth noting is that there may be an issue of standing for the other five defendants' challenge of this speech, although counsel for defendant Trump expressed in open court the possibility that he would join the motion after conducting his own investigation, each defendant only formally joined defendant's, defendant Roman's motion challenging the hiring of Wade after the speech had been made. So, he's saying, look, there's an issue on if there's cause for the other defendants to take this same forensic misconduct issue because they weren't part of this they. Because they weren't part of this motion that Roman first filed. They hadn't signed on yet. They hadn't filed their supplements to say, hey, we, we're backing this motion that Ashley Merchant filed on behalf of Roman. This is actually a really, really important footnote that he put in here. Because he's saying there's a separate stand issue of standing for those other defendants that do not include um, Roman and Steve Sadow, Donald Trump are kind of leaning more into being encompassed by the timing when Roman's motion was filed. But the other defendants weren't part of this at all, this motion. And if they references the people that filed the motion, didn't really include the other five defendants, doesn't really apply to their forensic misconduct claim because they couldn't have been the they that was referenced in the court in the church. Do you guys, do you guys, I'm probably mincing words there, um, but do you guys get why, how McAfee is delineating that? It's a good argument for Michael Roman and maybe for Donald Trump, but the others probably weren't part of they. More at issue, instead of attributing the criticism to a criminal, criminal accused general aversion, 
I think that's supposed to say criminally accused, um, general aversion to being convicted and facing a prison sentence, the district attorney ascribed the effort as motivated by, quote, playing the race card. She went on to frequently refer to Wade as, quote, the black man, while her other unchallenged uh, attorney, so talking about, what's her name? Adam Abate. Oh, I can't I remember. Anna, Anna Cross. So one white woman and one white man, meaning Anna and Adam. The effect of this speech was to cast racial aspersions at an indicted defendant's decision to file this pretrial motion. However, the speech did not specifically mention any defendant by name. Although not in improvised or inadvertent, it also did not address the merits of the indicted offenses in an effort to move the trial itself to the court of public opinion, nor did it disclose sensitive or confidential evidence yet to be revealed or admitted at trial. Yeah, and if you if you guys saw that church speech, they don't talk about like the evidence or really any any facts of the matter. It's a, why are they only bringing this motion against me or against Nathan Wade? Because the relationship wasn't publicly admitted to at that point. Um, it wasn't like, we have these facts, this is what we're finding. Like, it wasn't, she wasn't spilling evidence that was supposed to be under the record. Nor did it disclose sensitive or confidential evidence yet to be revealed or admitted at trial. In addition, the case is too far removed from jury selection to establish a permanent taint of the jury pool. As best it can, it can divine, under the sole direction of Williams, the court. So, we only have Williams to go by as case law, and because of that, me, the court, cannot find that this speech crossed the line to a point where the defendants have been denied the opportunity for a fundamentally fair trial, or that it requires the district attorney's qual disqualification. But it was still legally improper. So, a finger wave. Providing this type of uh, finger wag, <laughs> providing this type of public comment creates dangerous waters for the district attorney to wade further into. The time may well have arrived for an order preventing the state from mentioning the case in any public forum to prevent pre prejudicial pretrial publicity. But that is not the motion presently before the court. So that's a signal. He's like, hey, you know, it may be time for an order preventing the state from mentioning the case in any public forum. Gag order. So he's saying, he's signaling to the defense, I'd give you a gag order. I'd let the state stop talking. And he only says the state, which I guess is more relevant to the scope of this motion, but maybe he'd grant a unilateral gag order. But he is making a signal here that I do think it's time that we, you know, consider if you motion for it, if you make the motion, because I have to have something to issue an order on. You have to make the motion. But I would consider issuing something to prevent the state from making public statements at this point in time. But that is not the motion presently before the court. The defendant's motions demanding disqualification and dismissal on forensic misconduct are denied. And then other grounds. So we've only got two more pages, guys. This is just going to probably summarize the, you know, obviously the forensic misconduct and the possible personal and financial benefits. Was that an actual conflict of interest or just an appearance? And what's the remedy? You know, those are the major, major legal questions that Judge McAfee had to answer, but there were some other things, and that's what we're going to get to right at the end here. The defendants invoke a range of other constitutional, statutory, and county provisions in support of disqualification. So, they go for the trustee clause, various provisions of Fulton County Code, including financial disclosure requirements, and alleged payments and hiring violations. As to the latter, and a lot of this stuff is actually, guys, this is, this is statute, this is code, this is law. A lot of this is going to be things, um, you know, at the state level, this might be something that the state Senate committee is saying, hey, you know, we already have these laws about employees, but we don't really have criteria for special prosecutors. That's a gray area. And hearing what you had to say, Ashley Merchant, maybe we need to, you know, kind of create a new statute or amend the existing law to make the special prosecutor criteria for appointing someone a little less of a gray area, right? So these things being referenced here are something that, you know, a judge doesn't write laws. Judge doesn't make legislation. This would be something we could see, you know, novel legislation or amended legislation coming from the state Senate. As to the latter, a district attorney may appoint private attorneys. So Nathan Wade was a private attorney. He was hired as uh, a special prosecutor, but he wasn't hired as a direct employee of Fulton County. So he's he it's able 
the district attorney can appoint him to assist with criminal cases independent of any specific statutory authorization. The statute does not place limitations on the appointment of a special attorney to work on a specific case, as opposed to county approval of a general employee. So again, he's not a employee of Fulton County. He's, you know, he's a contractor. So he cites the amusement sales for state case. While Wade's contract did not limit his work to any particular case, the testimony established as much, and the defendants have not produced any evidence demonstrating that his work ever expanded beyond this prosecution. Further, to the extent that, that the defendants argue the circumstances of Wade's loyalty oath create independent grounds for disqualification, the court incorporates its previous order on the subject and denies the motion. Now, I thought this was interesting because um, I think we heard... Uh, we heard about this in closing arguments, but it's something that Ashley Merchant did bring up in the Senate committee as well. Um, but if we think about those six charges that were dismissed in yesterday's news, those all related to not exactly an, an oath of office being violated. It was not a decision that an oath of office was not violated or was violated or anything like that. Uh, yesterday's motion from Judge McAfee was a response to special demurs from several of the co-defendants. Um, that was saying, hey, the way this indictment is written, the prosecution has to be specific. They have to be detailed. We need to know fully what we're being accused of, because if we don't know what you're saying we did, we can't appropriately and fairly defend ourselves against what you're charging us with, right? So Judge McAfee was like, oh my God, guys, you didn't use any detail or specificity when writing this indictment on these six counts, and I've got I've to dismiss them because of that. And it all came down to what what is the oath of order? These charges involved um, Donald Trump and the co-defendants saying, hey, I'm calling you up and I'm we're charging you because we think you called someone up and told them to violate their oath of office. But they didn't describe what the oath of office was. They weren't specific about the language of the oath of office. And without that, you can't really specify what the defendant was allegedly trying to tell someone to do that would violate their oath of office. It was missing that specificity. But so I think that's interesting that he addresses this separate issue of oath of office where um, I believe it was Nathan Wade never signed an oath of office or there's no record, there's no paperwork of it. And that was an issue that some of the co-defendants had brought up in closing arguments and their supplements. But here, Judge McAfee is like, to the extent that the defendants argue the circumstances of Wade's loyalty oath create independent grounds for disqualification, the court incorporates its previous order. We've already went through this and denies the motion. So he's like, we already went through this. I don't even need to give more of a reason denying it. And then as for the, the remaining provisions and arguments, the court has not been presented with any authority that such violations, even if proven, amount to an actual conflict of interest nor that an appearance of impropriety can apply to any instance of inappropriate or wrongful behavior. In each case, applying the appearance standard, the impropriety was connected in some way to an allegation of a potential and previously recognized actual conduct. So, the case law doesn't support me to, for me to do anything else other than what I'm doing here. In a separate motion adopting the arguments of her co-defendants, Defendant Latham presents an additional theory. She asserts the right to call the district attorney as a witness at trial to examine her biases towards the defendants and demonstrate that she brought a politically motivated prosecution. Accepting the sole citation raised in support um, requires ignorance of the opinions surrounding context. Actually reading the case and authority upon which it relies and not simply quoting a head note reveals that the Court of Appeals' antiqu antiquated use of the word prosecutor referred not to the legal officer handling the criminal case on behalf of the public, but rather to the main witness for the state. So there was a decision made in that case, but the context doesn't really jive with what you're trying to say this case, how this case should apply here, how I should apply this authority in this decision here. Um, Defendant Latham asserts a, and he's citing a dissenting opinion here, Defendant Latham asserts a claim accurately categorized as one of the selective prosecution, and the United States Supreme Court has recognized that such claims are not a defense on the merits to any criminal charges themselves. So this is, you know, the, your grounds for a full dismissal of this case. It's not going to happen. Instead, a claim of, on this grounds, instead, a claim of selective prosecution must be brought in the form of motion asking the trial court to exercise its judicial power on equal protection grounds. Lacking such a showing here, so you didn't show me that, 
or any foundation in law or the rules of evidence, the motion's de denied. So we're not dismissing this case. So to sum it up, whether this case ends in convictions, acquittals, or something in between, the result should be one that instills confidence in the process. A reasonable observer, unburdened by partisan blinders, that's a call out to the public, <laughs> should believe the law was impartially applied, that those accused of crimes had a fair opportunity to present their defenses, and that any verdict was based on our criminal justice system's best efforts at ascertaining the truth. Any distractions that detract from these goals, if remedial under the law, should be proportionally addressed. After consideration of the record established on these motions, the court, me, finds that the allegations and evidence legally sufficient, legally insufficient to support a finding of actual conflict of interest. However, the appearance of impropriety remains and must be handled as previously outlined. So those two options, the office can step aside or Wade can step aside. However, the appearance of impropriety remains and must be handled as previously outlined before the prosecution can proceed. The defendant's motions are therefore granted in part and denied in part. He signed it with the blue pen. <laughs> and that's what we've got. That is the decision underlying the news today that Nathan Wade is off the case. Obviously, the Bonnie Willis and the district attorney's office did not decide to wholly step away from the case. They chose plan B, which was Judge McAfee said, or Nathan Wade can go. And that's the option they took. So... And then let's see, you guys have a ton of comments here. And then I do, oh, I've got stuff coming up at 12. Um, so I'm not ignoring anyone's comments. There's just some that I might have lost context to. And I'm going to pull up the ones that are clear for me to address without knowing what they were made in reference to. And yeah, so if <laughs> with uh, Wade being out of a job, that's, a, that's another wrench right back at Joycelyn Wade. And yeah, this case could have increased Wade's career. Now it's in the toilet. And then I didn't have any awareness of Nathan Wade or what he did in Cobb County. But now because of this hearing, because of this hearing and how widely publicized this hearing was, because it's, it's interesting, right? It's attorneys sparring with attorneys. That's It's like a legal battlefield. It's like legal trench warfare in its like highest, most visible forum. We got to watch it. Um, but without this this hearing and people talking about it so much, I wouldn't even be aware of Nathan Wade saying his $550 an hour job investigating misconduct at Cobb County prisons. Uh, the report was all in his head. I have such a huge issue with that. Because a prosecutor, you know, first of all, just a general employee that has to line item things. You can't just say, oh, I did the work. It's in my head. It's fine. Like, you would lose your contract work for any other in any other industry, um, especially for someone being paid as a public official to investigate something so important. Prison misconduct. People were dying in these prisons in Cobb County. Like it's in my head, and you know I wouldn't have known that without all this stuff with the hearing. But now that I know it, even if he wasn't ordered to step down. It would always be in the back of my mind that that man got paid $550 an hour to just have thoughts about misconduct and, and un unlawful prison deaths. But that's it. Just have thoughts. Like that, That's always going to be in the back of my mind now when I think about Nathan Wade. So yeah, this case was supposed to propel his career and he can't prosecute it. So that opportunity is off the table. And now it brought out so much other stuff that... Uh, a lot of stuff that I think is fair to think he's unlikable for. <sighs> and then <laughs> Barbara says that Wade and Bradley might get back together for a new law firm called Bad Boy Lawyers. <laughs> Lean into new personas. You know, branding for law firms is all the rage. It can really make a bring in the money and be the rainmaker brand. But yeah, so who has confidence in Wade? And then let's see. And then cell phone records will not be permissible in his court, right? The next time, right? What happens the next time? What What do you say then about these cell phone records and the CSLI data, the pinging of the towers? What about the next time that that's brought up in a case against somebody? Are you going to say the same thing? That's not conclusive. 
And yeah, I think that's weird because he, so he said he was a bit more clear about Nathan Wade. Uh, patently unconvincing, patently unbelievable, patently whatever. He was a bit more direct. But he also said, Fanny, you had poor judgment and you came up here and your testimony wasn't credible. What does that really imply? If a judge says, not a layperson, but a district attorney's testimony is incredible. What's the between the lines on that? Because he doesn't come out in this motion and say flat out, I think you lied. He says, I found the testimony of the witnesses, including Fonnie Willis and Nathan Wade, not credible. What does that mean? if Fonnie Willis is supposed to have direct knowledge of what she's testifying to. Because it wouldn't be speculation being an issue on her end. She has the first-hand knowledge. And he's saying, I found her testimony to not be credible. What's the implication of that? To me, that seems like the legal way to say you think someone was lying up on that stand without using the word lie to describe it in your order. So, yeah, I think you point out something. I agree. He says you were incredible, even though you only have firsthand knowledge. You're not speculating about things that you were doing. It's firsthand knowledge, and you're not credible with your firsthand knowledge. And yes, thank you. I wish I should look because you always have the when I'm like, whose name is what? Barbara's always here to be like, it was Anna Cross. <laughs> And then, so what do people think about Fani now she exposed some of her personality on the stand? What is the public confidence in her regarding this case now? Hmm, I wonder. So, <laughs> you know, we're out here on YouTube, right? We're in a YouTube chat. We're hanging out. You know, there's tons of food for thought. Um, we have, there were laughable moments in this. I get that trials can be serious, but there was still entertainment value. And if this is a situation where Fani Willis is, I, I can unequivocally say that if, if it's going to be Fani that decides, I'm going to take this on myself, I'm going to go up in that courtroom, and I'm going to be the one leading the, the questioning for the key witnesses, I'm going to be on that trial floor fighting this fight. I think everybody will agree that eyes are going to be all over it. Like, I don't think anybody wants to watch Adam Abate cross-examine, you know, Trump and his co-defendants, witnesses, right? But whether someone thinks Fannie Willis is likable or dislikable, whether they think she's entertaining, whether they love her, whether they think she's annoying, it's going to be entertaining if she gets up in that courtroom and says, well, if Nathan Wade's gone and I got to prosecute this myself, I got to stand up here in this, this court and move this trial forward, I'm going to ask the questions. It's, it's going to be fireworks. But you do have to wonder, because no matter what happens, with this office, with Fannie Willis and her office staying on the case, you know the co-defendant attorneys, their offices are already preparing arguments on appeal to appeal this decision that she could stay on when Nathan Wade was clearly removed. If you remove Nathan Wade, and it's because of relationship they had together, mutually, and it's enough to disqualify him, they're going to argue then the same facts should say that it's possible to disqualify her. So I think it doesn't really matter so much what we're sitting here thinking and how it moves forward. The appeals are going to be written anyway. Because again, there's just so much manpower. This isn't like a public defender case where... They're dealing with two capital murder trials and they don't have the time to worry about this stuff. There's multiple co-defendants that each of their attorneys have the opportunity to start drafting their appeals on the issue of how could you disqualify one person and not the other. So no matter how this moves forward, no matter what the public confidence is, there's already issues that are going to be raised to be adjudicated further about her remaining or her not being disqualified, her office not being disqualified. I, th I think it's going to be a long time before we see a result on it, but other than that, I don't have an answer for you, Cryptician.
I think people that made up their minds either way are going to think that it's this this decision's crazy. This is a split the baby decision. Um, other people are going to be like, well, what can you do? I think there's people, I can kind of see the arguments on both sides. Um, but the question's always going to remain. This, this motion to disqualify is never going to disappear from our memories. So... And all the drama from it is certainly not going to disappear from our memories. And yes, this is a great follow-up to what Cryptician's saying. She also has the two primary challengers already. Now, if you were on the fence, right, you have political aspirations, you thought about maybe I should run for this DA office. Oh, this hearing might be a good way. You know, incumbents usually have, it's more favorable for them to stay in and to run against them is statistically just a, a stronger, you got to put up a better fight to knock out an incumbent. Unless something's thrown in the way that makes the incumbent unelectable. Well, while this motion's going underway, some people were probably thinking like, hey, this might be a good time. I want to throw my hat in the ring and I want to run against the incumbent. I want to run against Fonnie Willis. Well, now if this order comes down <laughs> and it's like, yeah, <laughs> you had poor judgment. You made bad decisions. Nathan Wade's off this case. That's a big enough reason, even though she's not formally disqualified at all. She didn't choose that option. That could open the gate for another primary challenger to enter the ring, right? So there's implications all over the place for this. Um, Patrick says, Harry McDougall called this, called all this as making Fulton County into a global laughing stock. Yeah, that was Mike Drop, right? Mike Drop McDougald. This judge has kept the joke running. He's saying there's been a lot of wrongdoing, but I'm going to ignore it. I think that that honestly was a sentiment throughout. Haha, <laughs> that's bad, but this court can't do that do anything more than what I'm gonna do. That was the common sentiment through all of it. And then Lorraine says, um, am I saying your name right by the way? Is it Lorraine? Could it be that the judge had a decision at the outset and then set out to prove? He's being very cautious in his words. You know, I think so, and I think part of that is um he already he already knew. I think he's someone that's very interested in case law. Um, and he's young, right? So when I say I think of him, I could picture him wanting to be an, a judge in the appellate circuit. He's young, so right? He might be trying to go up there. But I think at the very beginning of this case, at the very least, he already knew what cases could be relevant. I doubt that the state or the defense put new case law across his table that he wasn't already researching and trying to consider. He just had to, hey, what are arguments are you making? What arguments are you putting on the record for me to consider? And then what evidence is there going to be on the record for me to use as the background information so I can make my decision? I think he already had his decision on on case law. And he was just looking to see, hey, are you going to give me enough evidence or is the state going to give me a, a good enough counter argument that, hey, you're going to change my mind on what the case law says? I think he had the case law. I don't know if he had a decision set out, but he could have. He could have. And, you know, he could have known. <laughs> he could have had in the back of his head this whole time, like, why is Nathan Wade the one appointed for this case? He could have been familiar with that Cobb County prison reports all in my brain thing. He could have had something like that in the back of his head, which he can't come out and say, but, you know, people are human, and when they kind of know something in the back of their mind, could influence what they do moving forward. And then, yeah, so, and that's a good point. So Barbara says he's writing this for the eventual appellate court review, and he's he's alluded to certain things, and also like, hey, I'm ready to consider, if you make a motion on it, this motion doesn't address it, but I am willing to consider a gag order on the state for making public statements about this case to avoid the potential tainting of a jury pool. He's made hints at certain things, like, do these motions now? I'm, I, I would consider it. Or, hey, th this is a standing issue. Or, hey, someone else will probably end up adjudicating this further, but it's not going to be me. So I think that's hand in hand. In hand I think these, you, Lauren and Barbara, your comments go very well together. And then, could it be that the judge made a decision at the outset? I think it's the same one. <laughs> We're a fast, chatty bunch. And then the judge is saying that funny, slim, shady. Oh. Uh. And then let's see. Wade will file for unemployment. Yeah, can you imagine if he really, right? Because if you weren't here, Damon, at the beginning of the stream, 
we chopped it up a little bit about the divorce case and the divorce attorney for Jocelyn Wade was like, Joycelyn Wade was like, he didn't give us any, like, we think he's hiding assets from us because he didn't produce anything, even though he was supposed to, about other assets he might have, like retirement accounts, stocks, things like that. Um, so the flip side of that is he's in his 40s and was making a ton of money, $550 an hour at one point, and still didn't think, even though he's also a business owner, he never considered to put money aside for things like retirement, even though he was making it, he wasn't living paycheck to paycheck. So that's interesting. You know, if you lose your income, he either has assets set aside that he might be kind of cush for, but then they got to come into play for this divorce case, or he's been blowing his money this whole time and he really doesn't have any assets to his name besides maybe the house that's going to be split in this divorce. And then he loses his contract. Oops. <laughs> and then, so let's see. I think, Lauren Green, I'm checking that box. So I think you're agreeing that the judge came in, he had his ducks in a row before everything proceeded. He just said, I got to do this for the public. And there's some indications in this motion that he's writing because he knows we're going to sit here and be like, what did Judge McAfee say? Um, and I think the judge knew it was a Hail Mary and let them run the play to keep it from being a being an appeal appealable matter. And, you know, I think I think he expects the appeals either way. Because they can appeal this this decision right here, right? Plus all the underlying little bits and pieces that they're let, putting forth as evidence in this appeal. So he knew. That's why he says at the end of like almost every paragraph, there's another authority that could look at this, but it's not going to be me. Uh, so I have to close out. I do have stuff to do at noon. So I am so glad that you joined me and we got to do this. I didn't think a decision would come out at 9 o'clock this morning, but it sure did. Um... And I'm so glad that you guys were here to discuss some of the things. I would love to chop it up all day about the tea on the divorce, Terrence Bradley and all that. I wish I could, uh, but maybe another time. Um, also, just as recent things, I was looking at, if you guys are familiar with, there was a big case over in Jamaica. Um, it went to the highest level of appeal. It went to the king um, over in the UK. It's really just an appeals court, but they call it that. Vibes Cartel like multi-million dollar recording artist. He's been in jail since 2011. He was convicted in 2014. He and four co-defendants were on trial. Four of the five were convicted. They, the ones that were convicted, just won their appeal. It was their final chance at appeal and they just won it. Um, really great hearings, really good transparency, good quality court recording, very interesting stuff. There was a lot of police witness and evidence issues Missing metadata from only one video of many videos that were taken from Vibe Car Vibes Cartel's cell phone. The only video that was missing the metadata. Oh no, I should say, it wasn't missing metadata. It had new data attached to it. That was different from the unchangeable metadata. It was the video that they tried to say put him at the scene of the crime when the underlying murder took place. This video that they used to convict him had, it's the only video that had this of all the videos in his phone that they looked at. This video that they say puts him in the house where the murder occurred at the time of the murder is the only one that has an extra time, an extra piece of data added to it that shows he was there at a different time, that this video was recorded at a different time than the metadata for that video shows. So... You know how I feel about bad police work. I might consider doing a video on that um, when I have some time. If you guys, it'd be interesting to look at, I'm not, I'm not familiar with Jamaica's court system. I've tried to read up on it a bit more in the last week or so. Um, but that might be the next thing I try to do a video on. We've got some Jonathan Major stuff. We have... Um, you know, the prosecution just filed their response, which seems like garbage on its face, but of course they didn't release the whole document. That looks like, you know, bad work and a, a an Alvin Bragg move at a, a big press coverage for scoring a conviction against a high-profile person, a black man. Um, you know how I feel about Alvin Bragg if you've been around this channel long enough. And we can look at that. We've got some stuff going on there. Um, if you guys have something outside of that, 
that you think we should look at, let me know in the comments because I always love a good case, especially if I can criticize a prosecutor, if I can criticize the government a little bit, I'm willing to do it. Um, but you guys, happy Friday. I think the lead attorney is streaming on this right now. I don't think he allows redirects, so I can't like redirect you to his channel, but there's probably him and other people talking about this motion and the new news. So if you want to continue this conversation, I've got other stuff to do, but just search like McAfee decision, Fanny disqualification decision. I'm sure you'll find a bunch of live streamers. I'm so happy you guys chose to come here and speak with me about it today. I always enjoy our chats. And remember, if you're looking for new shampoo and you want to, want to work your magic and get juicy information out of someone, <laughs> go with Pantene Pro-V, the Ashley Merchant shampoo. Take care, you guys. Have a good weekend if we don't talk sooner.